The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. This court, from recess, now sitting. Thank you. Please be seated. Turn our attention to the third case on this morning's docket, and that is case number 102478, State of Kansas v. Rodney L. Turner. Counsel may proceed. May it please the court, I'm James Eisenbrandt. I represent Rodney Turner, who is the petitioner in the Court of Appeals. He was the appellee and cross-appellant and obviously the defendant in the trial court proceedings. If I may, I would like to try to focus this argument on a couple of primary issues that I hope will be of interest to you all. The Court of Appeals basically agreed with us that the numerous references to an unsolved 20-year-old murder was irrelevant. It was not correct that that testimony was admitted before the grand jury. Secondly, that there was a violation of Mr. Turner's Fifth Amendment rights when Agent Delaney commented in front of the grand jury concerning his invocation of the Fifth Amendment, basically saying, well, if he has something to show us, why didn't he bring this in to you? And this is after invocation of the Fifth Amendment. The Court of Appeals did not agree that there was a constitutional violation of calling Mr. Turner before the grand jury and causing him to invoke the Fifth Amendment, by my count, approximately 140 times. It's our contention that that is a violation of Mr. Turner's Fifth Amendment rights. We had sent a letter to the prosecutor after we received the subpoena advising him that Mr. Turner, in no uncertain terms, would assert the Fifth Amendment. Do you think it was error to ask that first time? Excuse me? Do you think it's error to make the witness appear and invoke in person? I think that's a closer question, Your Honor, but yes, I would agree that that is correct. Now, I don't know what you're agreeing. I'm agreeing. I believe that it would be a violation of the Fifth Amendment under these circumstances to have called, to made him, to make him show up. As a witness. As a witness. After we had advised the prosecutor that we, that he would assert the Fifth Amendment, we raised the proper objections, we put it in writing, had a conversation with the prosecutor, and we were still required to appear. We again raised our objections before the grand jury to make sure that it was on the record, and then the questioning proceeded, and approximately 140 times he was required to assert the Fifth. Now, this is a matter of logistics. When Mr. Turner appeared and took the stand, was there someone that advised him that he had that right not to incriminate himself? My recollection is yes. My recollection of that is that that is correct. Counsel, how would you conform to the statutory process, though, if it's a violation of the Fifth Amendment to not even have the guy show up after you've advised that he's going to take the Fifth Amendment, to be able to do the, have the judge review the questions that might have been posed to determine whether the privilege was appropriate or not? Well, we had advised that we would assert the Fifth Amendment to any questions pertaining to his relationship 
with the uh, BPU. And I don't know of any, I don't know of any, um, there has been no question raised in the court below or in the briefing that somehow um, that the uh, procedure that you're suggesting should take place. I know of no basis in law that does happen if, for example, we were asserting some other privilege. There might be a question of waiver. There might be a question of whether it's proper. But here, this is pretty fundamental. Under the Constitution, a witness has the right to assert the Fifth Amendment if he believes the question would be incriminating. There, there was no issue of we are not going to be asking incriminating questions. So if, if, that answers your question. if, for example, your client was relying solely on the attorney-client privilege, he would have to appear, question be asked, assert the privilege, and then that could be put to the judge for ruling. If there was a question if there about was a whether question. it was a proper invocation, that would be correct. That would be correct. But you're but saying the same process does not apply if it's a Fifth Amendment privilege. That's absolutely correct. Now, the, the Court of Appeals took the position, well, this is like an inquisition under the Kansas statutes, and that under the inquisition statute, there is case law to say that, um, that a witness can be made to appear in front of a, an inquisition and proceed to take the Fifth Amendment uh, on each question. Well, there's a fundamental difference between an inquisition and a grand jury. In a grand jury, you have 15 citizens who are the sole determinators of whether or not there will be an indictment. In an inquisition, it is the prosecutor and the witness, and it is the prosecutor or the attorney general that makes the decision on whether or not there will be charges brought. And that is a vast difference between the two procedures. The weight of authority demonstrates great concern that lay jurors misinterpret the invocation of the Fifth Amendment to remain silent and see it as evidence of guilt. I think the amicus brief spells that out. Uh, Before you get into that, I want to go back to the analogy um, uh, using the Inquisition as an analog. Explain the difference between an Inquisition and a custodial interrogation by a law enforcement officer. And the reason I'm asking is if here if Delaney had taken Mr. Turner into custody and and interrogated once the uh, uh, invocation of Fifth Amendment right to remain silent had been um, unequivocally uh, communicated, there are no more questions. That's absolutely correct. But yet at an inquisition, which is essentially what you're saying is is an in essentially a custodial interrogation by the prosecutor. Well, that seems to be what the case law is in the state of Kansas, Your Honor. But I'm trying to get my head around what's the difference between a custodial interrogation by a law enforcement officer or a, a county attorney, and why should they be treated differently? Well, in if, if, I, were, if I were the decider in this thing, I would, I would say that the same rule should apply to an inquisition. My position is that is irrelevant because it isn't any place, it's not analogous to a grand jury. Um, and in fact, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, Bank of Nova Scotia case, the United States Supreme Court case, in that case, it's unclear whether or not the witness who invoked the Fifth Amendment had sent a letter to the prosecutor. What is clear is that once that witness invoked the Fifth Amendment, according to the Supreme Court's opinion, all questioning ceased. And at the very least, that's exactly what should have happened. But 
under the uh, guidance of the U.S. Attorney's Manual in the federal system, if a witness sends a letter, prefer, well, sends a letter unequivocally stating that they will invoke the Fifth Amendment, under most circumstances, the guidance from the U.S. Attorney's Manual is that that witness should be excused and should not be put before the grand jury. If, if you establish the constitutional errors that you're asserting, what is the remedy? Um, uh, dismissal of the indictment is rather extreme. The Court of Appeals found that there was evidence um, indicating that your client um, essentially did not work for the BPU or, or there was billings that did, weren't established and that should be enough to indict. Um, where, where are we at there in your mind about if we find that there's errors, what we should do? What is the remedy? Okay. And what standards should we use? Well, Your Honor, first of all, the remedy of dismissal is recognized. If you look at the uh, Bank of Nova Scotia case right. and the subsequent case of uh, mechanic, um, and we would contend that that is the remedy. Now, the question is, how do we get to that point? And the trial court in this case um, had before it some 40 pages, which we had excerpted from, granted, a large number of pages in the grand jury. These were the excerpts that contained the types of things that we have been complaining about. And there's no question that those things happen. And from a reading of those excerpts, the trial court found that there was prejudice, that there was a denial of the Fifth Amendment. The Court of Appeals said, well, yes, all that happened, and we agree that it happened, and some of it was a violation, and some of it was improper. But the Court of Appeals found there was no prejudice, and the way they found there was no prejudice was by going back, reading the transcripts, and making a determination that there was um, probable cause. Therefore, there was no uh, interference with rights. Now, quite frankly, I don't think that that is the test, and I will... I will get to that, and I want to explain how I get to that. Well, didn't the Court of Appeals look at the prejudice from the standpoint of prejudice of, of the defendant's uh, defense at trial? Yes, which is 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 exactly what I'm, I want to get to. So if, why if you, should if, we look at this as the prejudice of, of as it applies to? the determination by the grand jury. How do we get there? Okay. If, if we, if we uh, take the premise that there was sufficient evidence, if believed, because there was evidence both ways, that there was sufficient evidence, if believed, that would support a probable cause right. finding, how do we get that that was skewed uh, to lead to dismissal? Okay. In the words of Justice O'Connor, it's because it's a dead letter situation. If you look at her concurring opinion in the mechanic case, she concurs with the result in mechanic that the violation did not warrant dismissal. But what she is concerned about is how do these questions get brought before the court? And in the federal system, what often happens, first of all, these types of questions rarely happen, even in the federal system. And even, you know, even more so in Kansas, since we don't use grand juries, it's very difficult to ferret out these kinds of questions. And so what she has to say is, in the federal system, questions concerning grand jury abuse, such as we are discussing, are put off, often till trial and in, sometimes till the end of trial. Then, if there's a guilty verdict, you don't have to decide the question because there was prob at least probable cause 
subsumed in a guilty verdict. Of course, if the defendant is found not guilty, it's moot. So the question never gets before the court. And this is the same kind of thing. The Court of Appeals gave service to uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Nova, Bank of Nova Scotia case, but it really didn't go all the way. The test in the Bank of Nova Scotia case, which I think is appropriate, and it's not very often that I agree with federal rules relating to grand jury, but this is it. The prejudicial inquiry must focus on whether any violations had an effect on the grand jury's decision to indict. If the violations did substantially influence the decision, and the Court of Appeals found it did not, but the test goes on, or if there is grave doubt that the decision to indict was free from such substantial influence, the violations cannot be deemed harmless. And I think that that's where we are in this case. Everybody agrees this took place. And to say that, well, there was probable cause, therefore we don't have to consider that, is to say, how can one ever raise these types of issues? Because, Your Honors, in, in the grand jury context, there's only one side that's presented. The defendant doesn't have a right to show up, doesn't have the right to call witnesses. All the witnesses are called are the ones that are called by the state, not by the defense. And given the grave nature of the violations that everyone agrees happened, I don't think that you can say that there is anything other than grave doubt as to whether or not these violations, which are basic and fundamental, did not have an effect given the nature of this particular case. Are you saying an effect on the course of the grand jury's inquiry? Yes. Or on the result of their decision? I mean, uh, as I, I, don't I think th O'Connor's opinion seems to go to perhaps at least in part to the course of the inquiry or the direction or the contours of what the grand jury considers. But I, I take the majority opinion to reject that view, at least in part. Is that, would you agree? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I honestly don't want to quibble. I don't think the, the, um, the uh, majority opinion really reached that point. And I think that's my... I can't read her mind, but that's my opinion as to why uh, Justice O'Connor filed a concurring opinion, because she believed that the violation that took place did not warrant dismissal, but she has concerns about how do we get these questions in front of a court and get them decided until it's too late to do anything. So if we have doubts as to whether or not, for example, um, the, the suggestions about the murder affected the direction that the they to, the grand jury took even in terms of who were called as witnesses or the scope of the inquiry is that sufficient for us to find prejudice or do we have to find that it affected their decision to indict i think that what you have to determine is whether there is grave doubt that the decision to indict was free from such substantial influence what does that mean, though? That's what I'm, I'm trying to decide yeah, what, what that means. That's what you're trying to understand. I, my opinion and, and my position is that when you have <clears throat> Bank of Nova Scotia, Bank of Nova, Nova Scotia mechanic dealt with um, rules of grand jury procedure. They didn't deal with constitutional violations. Everyone, I would think, can agree that if there is a constitutional violation of this magnitude, to just say, well, because there was probable cause, we can't say that it didn't affect the outcome of their deliberations, especially 
when you realize in this particular case, the grand jury was, uh, was engaged in this. One of the grand jurors asked uh, uh, Agent Delaney, on the Chuck Thompson, I'm not even going to ask you to get into detail here. I don't think it's fair or relevant, but are you finding it easier to tie this all together? And Delaney goes on to say, some of the same names that came up have been coming up in this. And it's always been the people that are behind the scenes. That's the information without getting into a lot of detail on the homicide. But they are the same names are coming up. Then he also says to the, the uh, grand jury early on, I've got an agenda, and that's to solve the Thompson murder which had nothing to do with this grand jury, and help resolve the BPU, BPU issues if possible. I was concerned and interested in BPU because some of the people that were, we were hearing were involved in the BPU, we thought were involved in a murder case in, John, in Wyandotte County, and then he goes on to explain in great detail that murder and his investigation over the last 20 years or so. Now, the Court of Appeals found that was wholly irrelevant, improper, and the whole discussion of the murder never should have come up. Likewise, the invocation 140 times of the Fifth Amendment, and then thirdly, Agent Delaney's comments on the assertion of the Fifth Amendment. These are so fundamental that how can you say that there's not great, or that there is anything other than grave doubt about how these kinds of uh, violations could affect the outcome of this uh, grand jury? We aren't in there. We, there's no transcript of their deliberations. We can't say what they understood or didn't understand. But this was before them, and the Court of Appeals agreed, with the exception of the 140 invocations, that it was improper. Do we have any, excuse me, any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Please, the court. My name is Jerome Gorman. Um, I uh, am the district attorney in Wyandotte County and was involved in this particular grand jury. What I, relevance did the 20 uh, uh, year old murder have on, on this investigation of BPU? Initially, it was to explain why Special Agent Delaney. Uh, was involved with the BPU and why he had some knowledge of the BPU. And I'd like to explain that in that I think it's it's good to know that this was a citizen called grand jury. This was not a grand jury where the state went to the court at the time and said, we want to call a grand jury. We have something to investigate. This was so the Fifth Amendment and, and uh, uh, due process uh, is different if it's a citizen? Petition grand jury versus, if you call it? Um, it. No, between the two types of grand jury that were allowed at the time, they're not different. But I believe that the the grand, uh, due process is different than in a pettit jury, I think is the point that I want to make sure I make. Um, what, what I guess what I'm trying to explain here is that when this started, um, we didn't know where we were going with it. We didn't know. We were, we were by statute mandated to conduct a grand jury. Um, it wasn't, the state came in and says, well, we've got an investigation we need to conduct, and these are the people we're going to call. We went into this, like, what are we doing with this? Um, I, I think part of the record uh, was made was the petition itself um, that contained um, a poorly written document that w with uh, generalizations in that. And that's what we started with, trying to figure out where to go. Um, it was during the but, course but of this. At the point, at the point that Agent Delaney is commenting 
on Mr. Turner's exercise of his constitutional right to remain silent at that point, regardless of the genesis of the proceedings or whatever, do you agree that that was improper, whether it's a pettit jury or a grand jury, to, to make that comment? I, I agree that it was improper. Uh, what I guess I would disagree um, with Mr. Eisenbrandt is the result of well, that. No, I, my question is, was that a violation of, of the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, as well as a violation of the statutory right that says a witness can invoke? And, in fact, you advised Mr. Turner that he could invoke his right against self-incrimination, right? I did advise him of that. And yes. so that was an error at that point. Uh, with Agent Delaney commenting on that. Right. Yes. So we, we've established that there's an error of constitutional proportions that occurred during this grand jury proceeding. We agree that there was a violation. Um, I, I don't believe that the same due process rights apply at, at grand jury that they do at a pettit pet jury. So, so I don't want to call it of a constitutional. That's not a constitutional violation what you're saying or I'm saying is. I guess it doesn't have the same effect as if it occurred at a pettit jury but is what my, I'm saying. where I'm leading to is then once you have error uh, who has the burden of proof here does uh, mr. Turner have to prove the negative that that error did did not um, uh, or, or prove that it did affect the outcome or do you have to prove the harmlessness as you would in all other cases where the person benefiting from the error has the burden to prove that the error was harmless? Well, obviously, in a, in a jury trial or pettit jury, I would have the burden if that occurred. And in a case like this where I think we have to remember that uh, the appellate courts have said that a grand jury is an investigative tool. Not everything goes right in an investigation. Um, and so, therefore, I think when there is sufficient evidence to show uh, probable cause to charge, um, then I think it's the defendant's burden to show that that error had some uh, play in the reason that he got charged. Does that make sense? Um, I just don't, I un I I just think don't understand why. Pardon? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't understand why. You've just... Put it back on the defendant again. Okay, I understand that. But why does the defendant have that burden when it's been admitted that there's this constitutional violation? Because it's a grand jury and not a pettit jury. It's an investigatory, I mean, as this court said, it's an investigatory tool. There are other methods to prevent the error from affecting the defendant to proceed to trial. For instance, in if, if a... Justice Johnson, you asked a question earlier about uh, uh, custodial interrogation by a law enforcement officer. If a violation occurs there, it's suppression uh, of that evidence, not a ban on filing cases or a dismissal of the case. Uh, and I guess what I'm suggesting is it's no different in this situation is that – that uh, is But how do, you, how do you suppress – after it's already been presented. That's a suppression of the evidence uh, before it's presented to the, to the jury. If that's given to the jury, if that's given to the jury, then we reverse the conviction. It's more akin to presenting evidence at a jury trial that was constitutionally impermissible. Uh, we would reverse that, would we not? You would. And why shouldn't we reverse the uh, true bill here and say go back and do it correctly without constitutional violations because of the general nature of the grand jury so, except it's, aren't you denying that you keep saying general nature of the grand jury is investigatory but it's more than that i mean they make findings and they find probable cause which is significant it's it's not just investigating whether something happened or not and then handing it over to some other body that would make a probable cause determination they make the probable cause determination. So it's 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 you're saying that it's just investigatory isn't uh, doesn't carry doesn't carry much weight with me because it, it's it's a the vital function that occurs here is that finding and they have the power to indict and that can't be undone absent something like this. So 
I, I guess I don't see falling back on this. It's purely investigatory. It has much uh, merit to it when you give, you know, when it when it's authorized to uh, you know to when indict. You, when when the statutes, we don't put a judge in a grand jury room, right? Um, and there's they don't put defense. Well, defense counsel can, can uh, accompany a witness there, but there's no defense counsel per se uh, to cross-examine all the witnesses. Uh, so there's no, again, very little protection there. Absolutely. And the Constitution is what provides protection. I, I guess my point is, is that the only decision the jurors are making is whether there is probable cause. They're not making a guilt or innocence uh, decision here, and that's the difference. If they were making a guilt or innocence decision, then I wouldn't disagree with anything that you've asked. Well, they're making a charging decision. They are. And that's much more than just an investigatory tool. That's the second half of the function of the grand jury is the charging decision. I mean, those are the two main functions is, is the investigation and a charging decision. But that charging decision isn't guilt or innocence. That's the next step in it. And all the protections are afforded to the defendant at that stage. That's right? the first time he becomes the defendant is after that charging decision. So that anything that happened before that isn't, it hasn't caused him to be found guilty. It hasn't, no uh, guilt or innocence decision has been made. I want to, you started to talk about the, all the various references to the murder uh, the 20 year old murder and and I think you said that the reason that it came in in the first place was because the grand jury needed to know about why he was familiar with well, yeah I, or, it, it's a complicated uh, I, I guess didn't he kind of I guess where I'm going is the very first time he talked about it he himself recognized he shouldn't be talking about it there was a comment made he said I shouldn't be talking about this were you present when he said that? It was two of us that were involved in this uh, and two attorneys from my office, myself and another, and I don't remember at what point I was in there and what time I wasn't in there, so I can't say. It lasted for six months. There was, I forget, 20-something witnesses presented. I just so I can't, can't imagine say. why he needed to, why he would have to tell the jury about this 20-year-old murder investigation. That's not what the point of the grand jury was. That wasn't one of the issues they were charged with investigating. And when he recognized himself, he shouldn't be talking about it. And then it continues over the course of time. I, I just, I can't figure that out. Well, I don't, I don't disagree with you that it was not right to do. My only well, you were there. If you were there some of the times when he was talking about it, what action did you take when, when he was talking about this murder? Well, I can't remember exactly which times I was there and which times I wasn't, but I don't remember taking any action to stop him, as I don't know that it was our place to stop him. Um, there aren't a lot of rules and there aren't a lot of guidance on handling grand juries. Well, was it, your, it was you that decided you needed the investigator to assist the grand jury? We asked his assistance, yes. And it wasn't for the reason of telling them about a murder, a 20-year-old murder. It wasn't for that reason. I mean... During the course of his testimony, I, I had no idea that this was actually going to come up. It wasn't planned that it would come up. But during the course of him trying to explain, I think the jury wanted to know why he had knowledge, background of BPU, that came into the explanation. But they didn't need to know that. Probably didn't need no. to know that. I, I don't disagree with that. that. I don't disagree with that. And, and I think the jury realized, too, there was two occasions in there. Uh, Mr. Eisenbrandt quoted one where... Uh, yeah, I have one right here in front of me, which is where I was headed next. Okay. I, I this this I, I can't accept this as as oh, it's just uh, some extraneous stuff because juror four one nine zero zero, I think. Uh, in your heart, you mentioned the murder at uh, Jalisco and goes through that. We end up with Delaney saying. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes people get in a bind and get charged or indicted and they want to cooperate. Sometimes that'll help us. Always look for that road, too. He clearly told that jury if they could get an indictment on the BPU charges, that might help him get cooperation in the, in the uh, Thompson murder. 
I mean, there's no way that you can read that answer without that being intimated or suggested or even outright spoken to the jury. And we've gone beyond of, oops, he was talking about stuff outside the realm of relevance. He's letting them know if they will give him this indictment, he can solve a murder. Well, what I would point to are two other uh, uh, questions that the grand jurors themselves ask, not asked by the state. Um, because I think the question is, is whatever happened in that jury room, did it unfairly affect the indictment? Did it unfairly cause the indictment? There was uh, one exchange where one of the grand jurors, when he started to ask a question uh, about the uh, Thompson homicide and said something to the effect that, I, I don't think it's fair or irrelevant, but... So the juror recognized that it was Right, wasn't. but he followed up. Pardon? But he followed, he followed up. up with a question. He was interested. But, and but and that's my... the problem, is that the racy stuff gets their attention. I'm isn't... sorry, I didn't hear the last part. I, I think that's just... the problem, isn't it? The racy stuff gets their attention. I mean, they're there to kind of investigate well, a dry if... paper trail, and gosh, we get to talk about a murder, too? There was a second juror that a similar type thing where, where he said, I know it's not relevant, but, and he asked the question. I, I think the point I'm trying to make with that, though, is if the decision that you have to make is what the jurors heard that they probably shouldn't have heard unfairly affected their decision. And what I'm suggesting is that when we have on the record the very rare thing where we have jurors talking back, so we get some insight into what's going on in their heads instead of having to guess like we have to in so many cases. Here we have them interested. And how can we say we don't have a grave concern well, as your opponent stated I, I think stated just the from the very words they spoke is that we know this, what you're saying isn't relevant. Uh, we know um, that it shouldn't it, it, it be a part of our decision, but we want to know. You know, I think all the time we ask jurors to go in and make decisions. Can I just follow up on what I quoted you about uh, the officer saying sometimes this will help? The juror says, that is still open, question. Answer from the agent, yes, it is very open. The juror says, if something comes out of this, you can charge somebody? Answer, if something would come out of this, or I mean, I actually think I know who did it and why, but to present it to 12 people, I don't know that we're ready. So... And so the, we're, as Justice Byer is saying, they, they've gone beyond just hearing stuff. They're saying, uh, this juror is saying, if we give you your indictment, we might help you solve the murder case and you can still go forward. How do you interpret that? Do you interpret that any differently than I've characterized it? I don't it? interpret it that the juror is saying, if we give you your indictment, then we can help you solve. I, I, I interpret it that there was... Uh, a prurient curiosity there. Let's take, that. This, let's take this sentence. If something comes out of this, you can charge somebody. What does that mean? Why is a juror asking that? Because jurors don't know the process and don't understand. It's a curiosity on the juror's part. Counsel, you know, I don't, you're out of time, but I did want to ask a question. As I understand your position, you're admitting that there was some error. Yes, sir. And you're also telling us it's your position that it's the defendant's burden in this instance to show that that error was reversible, i.e. not harmless. Um, Is that right? That it's the defendant's, yes, correct, that it's not harmless. And what do you tell us is our standard to determine whether that burden has been met? We've heard from opposing counsel about grave doubt. Can you tell us what your view is? Well, or what standard we would use? My view is this, that it shouldn't be any different than, because I think the decision that you have to make is, isn't unlike a decision that uh, a trial judge has to make at uh, a preliminary hearing where evidence is presented on both sides and the trial judge says, I have to look at the evidence most favorable to the state um, and if there is evidence most favorable to the state, I have to bind them over. Now, I realize the bind over decision has already been made in this case by the grand jurors, but I think what you have to look at is, was there sufficient evidence absent any of this other evidence that we're discussing whether it should or shouldn't been been applied or heard? 
is there still sufficient evidence so once you reach probable cause under that theory you can just let in anything you could just let her rip you can just ask anything and go anywhere you want to go i don't guess i hate to answer that because i don't think there's a situation where we just let it rip and went wherever but that was mr eisenbrand's point is is that if you if you use that standard then nothing prevents um uh, violation of the constitution or anything once you've uh somewhere along the way, satisfied probable cause. That's not the situation we have here. I, I hate to decide somebody else's case later on on, on this. So. I, I see my time's out. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt, Chief. I just, no, uh, if I'm allowed to follow up. <laughs> I, I was just going to follow up by saying, at a minimum, we have a case where, as I understand from opposing counsel, and I think it's stipulated to, 140 different times, uh, Mr. Turner was asked about it, was asked a question and he invoked the Fifth Amendment. Is that right? I don't disagree with that. Okay. And although you said you were in and out of the grand jury room, I'm assuming you were there for at least part of those occasions. Well, I think I was there for every one of those occasions. If we're talking about the 40, 140 questions, yes. Yeah. So the question I'm asking is, looking at all this evidence that you're talking about, how do we determine what impact, if any, <coughs> that alone had on? this grand jury is can an argument be made that hearing somebody invoke 140 times is about like a jury hearing about a defendant's uh, criminal history or under 455 evidence of prior crimes how do we determine we've heard something like this that well yeah there's still sufficient evidence to go forward particularly in light of the questions that were posed by my colleagues, that we were hearing questions uh, asked by jurors, grand jurors themselves. Well, so, I, so my question is, what is our standard that we use? You're saying it's sufficiency of the evidence. I guess it's a simple way, simple way to say what I'm trying to explain. Yes, sir. Uh, and I, because it is a charging decision. And do you have a position on whether we should use in that calculus? grave doubt about the outcome, grave doubt about the grand jury being taken down uh, an improper road? How would you address that? I guess I don't have a position. I'm not sure that I don't have an answer for that, Justice. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So I, we, ign we ignore the Nova Scotia language about grave doubt about whether it influenced the jury, the grand jury? Well, um, I think that Nova Scotia isn't controlling here, that we don't uh, allow Nova Scotia case to control us because it's on a whole different set of circumstances. It was a procedural question in a federal grand jury, which is entirely different than our state grand jury. And so we should adopt the same test. And is that true even if it's a Fifth Amendment con federal constitutional violation? I know they weren't addressing the... Uh, constitutional violation in Nova Scotia, but wouldn't we assume that they'd at least apply that standard, if not a, perhaps even a uh, more significant burden for the for somebody? I guess in your view, this the defendant would have that burden. But I, I guess what I would say is that dismissal of the indictment is an extreme remedy, and uh, when there is sufficient evidence. Uh, to show the probable cause. Um, in, in your view, I mean, I, I guess earlier you had asked about, in, in my brief originally, I had suggested that there would be an unlimited review by this court when, when we wrote this uh, and argued this to the Court of Appeals. I realized they took a, an abuse of discretion standard. But this court can look at the evidence that was presented and, and say that uh, us weighing the evidence, that there was sufficient evidence, regardless of what else was presented? I don't know if that dances around your question. I'm trying to decide why dismissal of the indictment is an extraordinary remedy. Can you not turn around and present some of the information that you now are aware of because of the grand jury and an affidavit form to a detached magistrate and and. Uh, I can't today. No, I can't today no, because but, of statute of limitations. Um, had that day that happened, yeah, I probably could have. 
and nothing would have prevented uh, you know that. And I guess that's why I argue is that it's the extreme remedy because there was a way to protect the defendant uh, at a guilt or innocence trial. I, I was, are, are you done? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, that gets to something I've been bouncing around for 24 hours on on the uh, unique nature of this grand. This is a citizen grand jury and the role of the prosecutor with that. Am I correct that even though the grand jury returned an indictment and filed it with the district court as the prosec as the district attorney there, you still had the discretion not to pursue that. Is, is that right? I think that once it's filed with the district court, a case is initiated. I believe I would have the discretion to dismiss it, to right. move to dismiss it, yes. Right. And so you could have dismissed it because of concerns or because of issues with the grand jury process, dismissed it, and then turned around and refiled it and gone through a probable cause proceeding, I guess is my next question. Um, I guess I don't want to address your first premise. I'll just, yes, I could have dismissed it and turned around and refiled it by information. Okay. Could I follow up on um, something that was brought up early on about the invocation of the right to remain silent? The statute speaks to uh, contacting the judge to get confirmation of whether that was an appropriate invocation. I think Justice Biles asked about that. Uh, did you or your office contact the judge to question the propriety of invocation of the uh, right to which Mr. Turner had been advised? The short answer is, is no, we did not. The longer answer is, is that we had given that a lot of thought and was wanting to go in that direction because of our time limitations, you know, the grand jury actually expired and uh, we didn't do it. But but where I am is I, I understood part of the rationale for doing a question by question is the possibility that there would be a question for which invocation would not be appropriate and um, uh, w did you distinguish between your questions or or did you actually utilize that process? you understand what I'm saying? I, I, well, if, if you mean did we utilize the process, we did not go to the court. Did See, not my, end up doing that. And my concern is you tell someone they have the right to remain silent, but then you can basically testify for the grand jury through the invocation uh, of the rights, you could. Where did you hide the body? Did you have anyone help you with the murder? Da, 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 da. You could ask all of those questions, um, and that's you testifying before the grand jury, and you basically obliterated the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. And there's nothing that can do anything about it except. We hope your integrity will keep you from doing that, but under your uh, uh, argument, there's nothing to to prevent that, is there? No, there's not, just. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Like 30 seconds to wrap up. We think you've made your point. I think I've exhausted everything that I have to say, Justice. Very well. Thank you, counsel. Thank, Thank you. you both for your arguments this morning. The court will take this matter under advisement.